Keeping the heart in the time of duty. Our hearts must be closely watched and kept when we draw an eye to God in public, private, or secret duties. For the vanity of the heart seldom discovers itself more than at such times. How often does a poor soul cry out, O Lord, how gladly would I serve thee, but vain thoughts will not let me. I come to open my heart to thee, to delight my soul in communion with thee, but my corruptions oppose me. Lord, call off these vain thoughts, and suffer them not to estrange the soul that is espoused to thee. The question then is this, how may the heart be kept from distractions by vain thoughts in time of duty? There is a twofold distraction or wandering of the heart in duty. First, voluntary and habitual. They set not their hearts aright, and their spirit was not steadfast with God. This is a case of formalists, and it proceeds from the want of a holy inclination of the heart to God. Their hearts are under the power of their lusts, and therefore it is no wonder that they go after their lust, even when they are about holy things. Secondly, involuntary and lamented distractions. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me a wretched man that I am, and so on. This proceeds not from the want of a holy inclination or aim, but from the weakness of grace and the want of vigilance in opposing indwelling sin. But it is not my business to show you how these distractions come into the heart, but rather how to get them out and prevent their future admission. First, sequester yourself from all earthly employments, and set apart some time for solemn preparation to meet God in duty. You cannot come directly from the world into God's presence without finding a savor of the world in your duties. It is with the heart, a few minutes since plunged in the world, now in the presence of God, as it is with the sea after a storm which still continues working muddy and disquiet, though the wind may be laid and the storm be over. Your heart must have some time to settle. Few musicians can take an instrument and play upon it without some time and labor to tune it. Few Christians can say with David, My heart is fixed, O God, it is fixed. When you go to God in any duty, take your heart aside and say, O my soul, I am now engaged in the greatest work that a creature was ever employed about. I am going into the awful presence of God upon business of everlasting moment. O my soul, leave trifling now. Be composed. Be watchful. Be serious. This is no common work. It is soul work. It is work for eternity. It is work which will bring forth fruit to life or death and the world to come. Pause a while and consider your sins, your wants, your troubles. Keep your thoughts a while on these before you address yourself to duty. David first mused and then spake with his tongue. Number two. Having composed your heart by previous meditation, immediately set a guard upon your senses. How often are Christians in danger of losing the eyes of their mind by those of their body? Against this David prayed, Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in thy way. This may serve to expound the Arabian proverb, Shut the windows that the house may be light. It were well if you could say in the commencement, as a holy man once said when he came from the performance of duty, be shut, O oh my eyes, be shut, for it is impossible that you should ever discern such beauty and glory in any creature as I have now seen in God. You must avoid all occasions of distraction from without, and imbibe that intenseness of spirit in the work of God which locks up the eye and ear against vanity. Number 3. Big of God a mortified fancy. A working fancy, saith one, how much soever it be extolled among men is a great snare to the soul, except it work in fellowship with right reason, and a sanctified heart. The fancy is a power of the soul placed between the senses and the understanding. It is that which first stirs itself in the soul, and by its motions the other powers of the soul are brought into exercise. It is that in which thoughts are first formed, and as that is, so are they. If imaginations be not first cast down, it is impossible that every thought of the heart should be brought into obedience to Christ. The fancy is naturally the wildest and most untamable power of the soul. 
Some Christians have much to do with it, and the more spiritual the heart is, the more does a wild and vain fancy disturb and perplex it. It is a sad thing that one's imagination should call off the soul from attending on God when it is engaged in communion with him. Pray earnestly and perseveringly that your fancy may be chastened and sanctified, and when this is accomplished, your thoughts will be regular and fixed. Number four, if you would keep your heart from vain excursions when engaged in duties, realize to yourself by faith the holy and awful presence of God. If the presence of a grave man would compose you to seriousness, how much more should the presence of a holy God? Do you think that you would dare to be gay and light if you realize the presence and inspection of the divine being? Remember where you are when you engaged in religious duty and act as if you believed in the omniscience of God. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Realize his infinite holiness, his purity, his spirituality. Strive to obtain such apprehensions of the greatness of God as shall suitably affect your heart. And remember his jealousy over his worship. This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. A man that is praying, says Bernard, should behave himself as if he were entering into the court of heaven, where he sees the Lord upon his throne, surrounded with ten thousand of his angels and saints ministering unto him. When you come from an exercise in which your heart has been wandering and listless, what can you say? Suppose all the vanities and impertinences which have passed through your mind during a devotional exercise were written down and interlined with your petitions. Could you have the face to present them to God? Should your tongue utter all the thoughts of your heart when attending the worship of God would not men abhor you? Yet your thoughts are perfectly known to God. Oh, think upon this scripture. God is greatly to be feared in the assemblies of his saints, and to be had in reverence of all them that are round about him. Why did the Lord descend in thunderings and lightnings and dark clouds upon Sinai? Why did the mountain smoke under him, the people quake and tremble round about him? Moses himself not accepted, but to teach the people this great truth, let us have grace whereby we may serve him acceptably, with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Such apprehensions of the character and presence of God will quickly reduce a heart inclined to vanity to a more serious frame. Number five. Maintain a prayerful frame of heart in the intervals of duty. What reason can be assigned why our hearts are so dull, so careless, so wandering, when we hear or pray, but that there have been long intermissions in our communion with God? If that divine unction, that spiritual fervor, and those holy impressions which we obtain from God while engaged in the performance of one duty were preserved to enliven and engage us in the performance of another, they would be of incalculable service to keep our hearts serious and devout. For this purpose, frequent ejaculations between stated and solemn duties are of a most excellent use. They not only preserve the mind in a composed and pious frame, but they connect one stated duty, as it were, with another, and keep the attention of the soul alive to all its interests and obligations. Number six, if you would have the distraction of your thoughts prevented, Endeavor to raise your affections to God and to engage them warmly in your duty. When the soul is intent upon any work, it gathers in its strength and bends all its thoughts to that work. And when it is deeply affected, it will pursue its object with intenseness. The affections will gain an ascendancy over the thoughts and guide them. But deadness causes distraction, and distraction increases deadness. Could you but regard your duties as a medium in which you might walk in communion with God, in which your soul might be filled with those ravishing and matchless delights which his presence affords, you might have no inclination to neglect them. But if you would prevent the recurrence of distracting thoughts, if you would find your happiness in the performance of duty, you must not only be careful that you engage in what is your duty, but labor with patient and persevering exertion to interest your feelings in it. Why is your heart so inconstant, especially in secret duties? Why are you ready to be gone almost as soon as you are come into the presence of God, but because your affections are not engaged? 
Number seven, when you are disturbed by vain thoughts, humble yourself before God and call in assistance from heaven. When the messenger of Satan buffeted Paul by wicked suggestions, as is supposed, he mourned before God on account of it. Never slight wandering thoughts and duty of small manners. Follow every such thought with a deep regret. Turn to God with such words as these, Lord, I come hither to commune with thee, and here a busy adversary in a vain heart, conspiring together, have opposed me. O oh God, what a heart have I! Shall I never wait upon thee without distraction? When shall I enjoy an hour of free communion with thee? Grant me thy assistance at this time. Discover thy glory to me, and my heart will quickly be recovered. I come here to enjoy you. And shall I go without you? Behold my distress and help me. Could you but sufficiently be well your distractions and repair to God for deliverance from them, you would gain relief. Number 8. Look upon the success and the comfort of your duties as dependent very much upon the keeping of your heart close with God in them. These two things, the success of duty and the inward comfort arising from the performance of it, are unspeakably dear to the Christian, but both of these will be lost if the heart be in a listless state. Surely God hears not vanity, nor does the Almighty regard it. The promise is made to a heart engaged. Then shall you seek for me and find me when you search for me with all your hearts. When you find your heart under the power of deadness and distraction, say to yourself, Oh, what do I lose by a careless heart now? My praying seasons are the most valuable portions of my life. Could I but raise my heart to God, I might now obtain such mercies as would be matter of praise to all eternity. Ninthly, regard your carefulness or carelessness in this matter as a great evidence of your sincerity or hypocrisy. Nothing will alarm an upright heart more than this. What shall I give way to a customary wandering of the heart from God? Shall the spot of the hypocrite appear upon my soul? Hypocrites indeed can drudge on in the round of duty, never regarding the frame of their hearts, but shall I do so? Never. Never let me be satisfied with empty duties. Never let me take my leave of a duty until my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Number 10. It will be of special use to keep your heart with God in duty, to consider what influence all your duties will have upon your eternity. Your religious seasons are your seed times, and in another world you must reap the fruits of what you sow in your duties here. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you will reap life everlasting. Answer seriously these questions. Are you willing to reap the fruit of vanity in the world to come? Dare you say, when your thoughts are roving to the ends of the earth and duty, when you scarce mind what you say or hear, now, Lord, I am so into the Spirit. Now I am providing and laying up for eternity. Now I am seeking for glory, honor, and immortality. Now I am striving to enter in at the straight gate. Now I am taking the kingdom of heaven by holy violence. Such reflections are well calculated to dissipate vain thoughts. Seventh, the seventh season, which requires more than common diligence to keep the heart, is when we receive injuries and abuses from men, such as the depravity and corruption of man, that one has become as a wolf or a tiger to another, and as men are naturally cruel and oppressive one to another, so the wicked conspire to abuse and wrong the people of God. The wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. Now when we are thus abused and wronged, it is hard to keep the heart from revengeful motions, to make it meekly and quietly commit the cause to him that judges righteously, to prevent the exercise of any sinful affection. The spirit that is in us lusteth to revenge, but it must not be so. We have choice helps in the gospel to keep our hearts from sinful motions against our enemies and to sweeten our embittered spirits. Do you ask how a Christian may keep his heart from revengeful motions under the greatest injuries and abuses from men? I reply, when you find your heart begin to be inflamed by revengeful feelings, immediately reflect on the following things. Number one, 
urge upon your heart the severe prohibitions of revenge contained in the law of God. However gratifying to your corrupt propensities revenge may be, remember that it is forbidden. Hear the word of God. Say not, I will recompense evil. Say not, I will do so to him as he has done to me. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Avenge not yourselves, but give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. On the contrary, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. It was an argument urged by the Christians to prove their religion to be supernatural and pure, that it forbids revenge, which is so agreeable to nature, and it is to be wished that such an argument might not be laid aside. Awe your heart, then, with the authority of God in the Scriptures, and when carnal reason says, My enemy deserves to be hated, let conscience reply, But does God deserve to be disobeyed? Thus and thus hath he done, and so hath he wronged me. But what has God done that you should wrong him? If my enemy dares boldly to break the peace, shall I be so wicked as to break the precept? If he fears not to wrong me, shall I not fear to wrong God? Thus let the fear of God restrain and calm your feelings. Number two. Set before your eyes the most imminent patterns of meekness and forgiveness that you may feel the force of their example. This is a way to cut off the common pleas of flesh and blood for revenge. As thus, no man would bear such an affront. Yes, others have borne as bad and worse ones. But I shall be reckoned a coward, a fool, if I pass by this. No matter, so long as you follow the examples of the wisest and holiest of men. Never did any one suffer more or greater abuses from men than Jesus did, nor did any one ever endure insult and reproach and every kind of abuse in a more peaceful and forgiving manner. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. When his murderers crucified him, he prayed, Father, forgive them, and herein he has set us an example that we should follow his steps. Thus his apostles imitated him. Being reviled, they say, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. I have often heard it reported of the holy Mr. Dodd that when a man enraged at his close, convincing doctrine assaulted him, smote him on the face, and dashed out two of his teeth, that meek servant of Christ spit out the teeth and blood into his hand and said, See here, you have knocked out two of my teeth and that without any just provocation, but on condition that I might do your soul good, I would give you leave to knock out all the rest. Here was exemplified the excellency of the Christian spirit. Strive then for the spirit which constitutes the true excellence of Christians. Do what others cannot do. Keep the spirit in exercise, and you will preserve peace in your own soul and gain a vic victory over your enemies. Number two, consider the character of the person who has wronged you. He is either a good or a wicked man. If he is a good man, there is light and tenderness in his conscience, which sooner or later will bring him to a sense of the evil of what he has done. If he is a good man, Christ has forgiven him greater injuries than he has done to you. And why should you not forgive him? Will Christ not abrade him for any of his wrongs, but frankly forgive them all? And will you take him by the throat for some petty abuse which he has offered you? Number three. But if a wicked man has injured or insulted you, truly you have more reason to exercise pity than revenge toward him. He is in a deluded and miserable state, a slave to sin and an enemy to righteousness. If he should ever repent, he will be ready to make you reparation. If he continues impenitent, there is a day coming when he will be punished to the extent of his deserts. You need not study revenge. God will execute vengeance upon him. Number four. Remember that by revenge you can only gratify a sinful passion, which by forgiveness you might conquer. Suppose that by revenge you might destroy one enemy, yet by exercising the Christian's temper you might conquer three. Your own lust, Satan's temptation, and your enemy's heart. If by revenge you should overcome your enemy, the victory would be unhappy and inglorious, for in gaining it you would be overcome by your own corruption. But by exercising a meek and forgiving temper, you will always come off with honor and success. It must be a very disingenuous nature indeed upon which meekness and forgiveness will not operate. It must be a flinty heart which this fire will not melt. 
Thus David gained such a victory over Saul, his persecutor, that Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I. Number five. Seriously propose this question to your own heart. Have I got any good by means of the wrongs and injuries which I have received? If they have done you no good, turn your revenge upon yourself. You have reason to be filled with shame and sorrow that you should have a heart which can deduce no good from such troubles, that your temper should be so unlike that of Christ. The patience and meekness of other Christians have turned all the injuries offered to them to a good account. Their souls have been animated to praise God when they have been loaded with reproaches from the world. I thank my God, said Jerome, that I am worthy to be hated of the world. But if you have derived any benefit from the reproaches and wrongs which you have received, if they have put you upon examining your own heart, if they have made you more careful how you conduct, if they have convinced you of the value of a sanctified temper, will you not forgive them? Will you not forgive one who has been instrumental of so much good to you? What though he meant it for evil? If through the divine blessing your happiness has been promoted by what he has done, why should you even have a hard thought of him? Number six. Consider by whom all your troubles are ordered. This will be of great use to keep your heart from revenge. This will quickly calm and sweeten your temper. When Shimei railed at David and cursed him, the spirit of that good man was not at all poisoned by revenge. For when Abishai offered him... If he pleased, ahead of Shimei, the king said, Let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? It may be that God uses him as his rod to chastise me, because by my sin I gave the enemies of God occasion to blaspheme. And shall I be angry with the instrument? How irrational were that! Thus Job was quieted. He did not rel and meditate revenge upon the Chaldeans and Sabaeans, but regarded God as the orderer of his troubles, and said, The Lord has taken away, blessed be his name. Number 7. Consider how you are daily and hourly wronging God, and you will not be so easily and flawed with revenge against those who have wronged you. You are constantly affronting God, yet he does not take revenge on you, but bears with you and forgives. And will you rise up and avenge yourself upon others? Reflect on this cutting rebuke, O thou wicked and slothful servant. I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest thou not also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? None should be so filled with forbearance and mercy to such as wrong them, as those who have experienced the riches of mercy themselves. The mercy of God to us should melt our hearts into mercy toward others. It is impossible that we should be cruel to others, except we forget how kind and compassionate God has been to us. And if kindness cannot prevail in us, methinks fear should. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Number 8. Let the consideration that the day of the Lord draws nigh restrain you from anticipating it by acts of revenge. Why are you so hasty? Is not the Lord at hand to avenge all his abused servants? Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth, and so on. Be ye also patient, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge stands at the door. Vengeance belongs unto God, and will you wrong yourself so much as to assume his work?'